In this video lecture for Water in the West, uh, we're going to be talking about the use of trend lines or regression lines for making predictions. So before we get into the actual material, I want to cover the objectives for this video lecture. So by the end of this video lecture, you should be able to list some important information that can be found from trend lines um, or regression plots that we generate in spreadsheet applications like Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets. We want to be able to use a regression equation to make an actual prediction. Um, and often in, in the earth sciences and the environmental sciences, this corresponds to um, calculating a, a, value, a value of a variable of interest um, at a location in which we don't have data or potentially a time in which we don't have uh, data. The next thing that we want to do is describe uh, how to interpret the R squared value. And we'll, we'll define what R squared is, but we want to know how to interpret that value when we get it from our regression equations and um, know, you know what it tells us and what it doesn't tell us um, ab about how well our regression or our trend line equation does at predicting our observed data. And finally, um, we, we want to kind of be a little bit careful and um, create some caveats and maybe some cautions about using regression equations, um, both linear ones and even more sophisticated versions of them, or you know, these statistical relationships for making predictions. They're very exceptionally powerful tools for understanding, um, understanding Earth and environmental systems but they have their limitations. And if we're not careful and exercising good judgment as scientists, we can get ourselves in, in a bit of trouble. So if you recall from class this past week, uh, I we did an activity in which I split you up into teams of about three or four students. And in your small groups, uh, I gave you the location of the Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, Idaho Snow Survey site. And you use their interactive map to find the location of a snow tell site in the state of Idaho. And um, you, got the, you got some data for February 7th, 2021. So you got both the snow depth and the snow water equivalent. And with that snow depth and snow water equivalent, you calculated the value of snow density um, in pounds per cubic feet, which is shown here on the y-axis. Okay, And you also grabbed the elevation of the snow tell site that you got that data from. And that's what's plotted here on the x-axis. So this is elevation increasing to the right, density increasing as we go up. and um, what I wanted to do is, you know, so you, you calculated this and you filled in a shared spreadsheet that all of us had. Um, and what I did is a, a very quick check or hypothesis test is I went and I applied, I clicked add trend line in Google Sheets um, to, to uh, get an equation that fits a line to this data to see if there was a relationship between our calculated snow density and the elevation of the snow tell site. And if we look at this, indeed there was. So uh, what this trend line indicates is that as we go up in elevation, our snow density that we calculated, the snow density, density that is inferred from the snow depth and, and snow water equivalent data actually decreases, right? And the key thing that um, that we want to sort of examine in this lecture are two things. Um, the first thing that we want to look at is this actual equation here, right? So this is the equation that um, that Google Sheets used to fit um, our calculated snow density to elevation data, right? So it, it did a real quick analysis and it spat out this trend line um, and um, uh, that trend line sort of describes a line that sort of seems to fit through the data, right? And we won't talk about sort of how it fits that curve. That's the subject for um, future courses. But um, this is the equation that describes this 
line here, right? And so if we look at this equation as well, it's in the form of, you know, y equals m times x plus b, right? And um, this is the slope. So we're just doing some terminology here. This is the intercept. Um, we will refer to this as the so-called predictor variable. This is what we are supplying to our regression equation to predict. And this is what we would call the response variable. Okay. Okay, so in this case here, this is, you know, this equation here, which we're going to sort of disentangle, um, this is the equation for that line, and these are sort of the constitutive parts of that line. So on the next slide here, what I've done is I've just taken that same equation, I've rewritten it, and I've changed the variable names to be more physically meaningful to show what they are, because what I want to do is go through sort of... Um, a few parts of this regression equation to underscore some really important and powerful things that this regression equation is telling us about our data. Okay, so um, here uh, rho sub s is the snow density in pounds per cubic feet. Z is the elevation in feet, okay, and um, th this here again, this is our, Z is our, would be our predictor, and rho sub s is our response variable, okay. So let's go through and let's look at some really important things about um, this equation, okay. So the first thing that we want to look at is the sign S-I-G-N of the slope, right? So if we look at the sign here, um, in this case, it is negative, right? Um, and the, the significance of the negative sign is that it tells us the direction of the relationship between elevation and snow density. And specifically, it tells us that the snow density tends to decrease as we increase elevation at least a you know, on this particular day in which we got the data in Idaho for these conditions, right? So the, the sign of that relationship is, is something really significant that we're always looking for. That's one of the first things that we look at anytime we construct any kind of trend or regression relationship, right? Is, is what does this sign tell us about the direction of the relationship between my, my uh, predictor variable and my response variable. Closely related to that, um, so the 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 um, the the sign of the slope is telling us the direction of the relationship. The slope itself is telling us the magnitude, and the slope has units, right? So in this case, um, the units of the slope, right? So like all equations, this this equation has to work out dimensionally. So when we supply as input an elevation in units of feet, we need to get out um, a snow density in units of pounds per cubic feet. And so our slope has units of um, pounds per cubic foot per foot in elevation change, right? So, and um, so, and it, is minus 9.89 times 10 to the minus 4, okay? And that's significant because this is telling us how quickly the snow density is going down as we go up in elevation, okay? And um, in you know, that's a really small increment in snow density for every foot change in elevation. But for instance, um, if we were to just multiply the top and bottom by a thousand, right, um, that's just multiplying by one, we would find that, you know, we get about a minus one pound per cubic foot change in density for every thousand feet 
in elevation, right? So that's a really, that's an interesting um, kind of finding, right? So the slope has units, that's the first important thing, and its magnitude tells us the, you know, how quickly, um, how quickly the, the, you know, the response variable is changing with the change in the, um, in the predictor variable. And finally, the thing that I want to point out here is that the equation itself is just a math equation and that we as scientists um, really need to be careful about how we use this and how we apply it to systems or locations um, where it may not be applicable, right? And so um, I want to I want to do two calculations with this equation just to point out um, that they're both very powerful, but they can also be um, applied, you know, um, inappropriately. Okay. So um, so first off, you know, we had um, we had uh, sites at elevations that ranged between about you know 4,400 feet and about 9,500 feet. We don't have an observation at 10,000 feet, but that's only 500 feet above our highest snow tell site. So let's ask ourselves, what is the snow density at a location that um, is at 10,000 feet in elevation, right? So, uh, so at 10,000 feet, what is the snow density? And we just use the equation here, right? So it's just a plug and chug. Rho sub s equals minus 9.89 times 10 to the minus fourth times 10,000 uh, plus 21.7. Okay, and it you know the the math actually works out uh, pretty pretty easy for us, right? So uh, if we um, just take minus uh, 9.89 times 10 to the fourth times 10,000, 10,000 is just 10 to the fourth, right? So we get just a minus 9.89 plus 21.7. So that's just 21.7 minus 9.89 that equals 11.8, right? So 11.8, that's what we would get at 10,000 feet. Rho sub s equals uh, 9.8. Did I say that right? No, 11.8, sorry. 11.8. Pounds per cubic feet. Okay, at 10,000 feet, right? So um, this is this is kind of cool because this now gives us an expectation. If we were to go to a, lo a location, um, at least again on that date that was uh, at 10,000 feet, and we took a snow sample, this might be a good prediction of of what we would get for the snow density. On the other hand. Um, you know, we could take this equation and apply it completely inappropriately, right? So we could ask ourselves, um, what about at an at a elevation of zero at sea level? What is the snow density? Okay. Well, um, you know, if we go up and plug that in, um, zero times nine minus nine point eight nine times ten to the minus fourth is zero. Add the twenty one point seven. You know, so we would get a rho s value of 21.7 pounds per cubic feet. And um, the math, you know, the math let us do that. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, that calculation, but um, we just performed a calculation at an elevation um, where, you know, there, there, doesn't exist in Idaho, right? Is but is beneath the land surface, um, and you know the closest place with an elevation of zero, zero feet is probably at least 500 miles away, right? And so, um, again, the the mathematics allowed us to do that. We got a perfectly reasonable number for um, snow density, but um, 
but it's sort of physically implausible, right? It doesn't really make any sense to have computed that that value to begin with, right? And so um, I, I do that calculation just to sort of underscore that although something can be sort of mathematically feasible, we as scientists really need to take care in whether or not we're applying that equation under the right circumstances. Okay, so the second part of this regression equation that um, I want to take a look at and, and drill down deeper into is this R squared value, right? So R squared equals 0.492. Okay, so what what is this R squared value? What is it telling us? What is it not telling us? Okay, so um, R squared is just a, a so-called goodness of fit measure, right? It, um, it represents how well, how strong the relationship is between two variables. Um, it, it's formally known, it has a definition as the, the so-called coefficient of determination. Uh, very few people actually refer to it as the coefficient of determination colloquially. Uh, we just call it R squared. Um, and it is a measure of the strength of the correlation between our predictor variable in that previous case, elevation, and our response variable, snow density. And in this case, the value of R squared is 0.492, okay? And the way that we usually describe the magnitude of that correlation um, is as kind of the percent of the variability or the percent of the variance in our response variable that is explained by the predictor, right? So if I had done this calculation, if I had presented this in a slide at a scientific meeting, um, I would, for instance, say something like, uh, in our data, elevation accounts for about half, right? 0.492 is about half or 50% of the variability in our observed snow density data, right? So, um, so elevation explains about 50% of the variability in uh, snow density. So that's about a, a middle of the road um, value. Um, so, you know, the, there are n members on R squared um, in these uh, in these uh, linear regressions. Um, zero means that there's no relationship and uh, one means that the relationship is perfect. As you might imagine, you know, you almost never get those end members, right? Um, it's, it's very seldom the case that there's, um, if ever, I don't know that I've ever seen it, that there's literally zero relationship between two variables, right? There's always some kind of like spurious uh, level of relationship between two variables when you plot them up against one another. Um, and, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, we almost never, you know, or never get a, a perfect relationship between two variables, right? But in general, what we're asking ourselves is, you know, how close is our value of R squared towards either one of these end members, right? Is it is it really a really good, strong predictor, meaning it's, you know, maybe point in the point eight and above, or is it really pretty poor, maybe down like below, 0.3 or something. And in our case, um, 0.492 is not particularly bad. Um, you know, we're, we're describing a lot of the variation in, um, in snow density with elevation. Um, but again, it's not perfect, right? Um, so, uh, so, you know, that's sort of how to interpret it, right? Um, is is the, the degree to which the strength with which our, our predictor variable can predict our response variable. Um, there's a lot out there on the the use and misuse of these regression equations. Um, the this is from XKCD Comics, uh, which is sort of a, a a nerdy comic. And you know what it's saying here is I I don't trust linear regressions when it's harder to guess the direction of the correlation from the scatter plot than to find new constellations on it. Right. So. Um, Oftentimes, you know, when we go out and collect data and spend a really long time, you know, a lot of effort collecting data or doing experiments or um, creating model runs, the, the, there's a really natural and strong human desire to want to see 
a relationship in that data when we plot it up against one another and it can be quite literally heartbreaking when there's not a relationship but um, you know we as scientists need to approach this in a way that we understand that hey you know sometimes there's very little relationship between variables when we thought maybe there would have been um, and in fact maybe that's an that's an interesting observation itself right it's like oh I, I would have thought that these things were related and it turns out that they're not related really well right so um, so this slide and this comic really is to just sort of um, to encourage you to sort of treat regressions that you see um, and regressions that you yourself do with a healthy degree of skepticism to try and really say you know am I really is there really something here or um, you know am I, am I just kind of plotting plotting a line the other temptation, right, is uh, once we have our data and once we maybe plot, um, you know, a linear regression is to get more sophisticated in our curve fitting method. And, you know, in, in future classes, you're going to learn some of these methods. And, you know, these methods are great. They're very mathematically powerful. Um, so uh, what you're seeing in this other XKCD um, uh, comic is the same data plotted on the, the X and Y axes with increasingly complex ways of fitting curves to that data, right? And this is, a, a, again, a very natural tendency, right? I want to squeeze as much predictive power out of that data as I can get. Um, and we just need to be very careful when we do that, right? Um, these um, statistical tools um, are just that. They're statistical ways of creating equations and math that allow us to make predictions at places where we don't have data or where we would like to know the value of our variable. Um, they're also very useful for exploring data, right? Just it's going back to that conversation about the, the sign of the slope and the magnitude of the slope, right? They can tell us some really interesting things about the direction of relationships um, and the strength of that relationship, or how rapidly one thing changes as we change another. But at the end of the day, as we again illustrated with that calculation of, you know, com doing a computation and a calculation at a place that didn't make any physical sense, um, there, you know, these are based on mathematical models or, or, or methods um, that don't necessarily, but may have, you know, some underlying be capturing some underlying lying physical phenomena. So, you know, you and we are kind of the experts that really need to sort of step back and say, okay, is this an appropriate use of this math? Um, is this an appropriate use of this equation? And I, you know, as you all know by now, um, find it, um, I often draw analogies with things, right? And, you know, when it comes to these curve fitting methods, it's, it's often the case that, you know, a, a more complex model can produce more precise answers, but they may not necessarily be better answers, right? So the, the question I'd pose to you here is, um, is a Ferrari a good grocery wagon? I mean, sure, you could use it, right? I could use a Ferrari to go pick up, you know, groceries at Albertsons three blocks away. Is that the best tool for that or will a simpler tool work just as well. My RAV4 is probably just fine um, for, for doing that, right? And so, um, you know, so there are tons of these tools out there increasing, you know, some of you heard about, you know, mach so-called machine learning and artificial intelligence. Those are increasingly used in the earth and environmental sciences to help explore data, to help make better predictions. And they are exceptionally powerful tools um, for doing that. But Anytime we use these tools, whether it's a simple linear regression or some complex machine learning algorithm, we just need to be very careful um, and ask ourselves whether or not we are using these tools appropriately, whether we are using them under the assumptions in which they were um, framed and formulated. And, um, you know, and that will help us kind of be confident in the answers that we get but um, also to ensure that we sort of don't get in, in trouble when we're making predictions.